Now, hedge funds have come under pressure in recent times, largely uh, because of fees and also returns lagging the general equity market. But I know that the next panel has, has strong views on this, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion. I'd like to welcome the last panel before lunch, which will be moderated by Deepak Abraham, who's the head of prime brokerage and equity financing for MENA at Bank of America. So please welcome Deepak and the last panelists. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Deepak Abraham, as Rachel said. I'm a managing director at Bank of America, uh, responsible for a number of businesses, including the, in our hedge fund business. But I'm not the reason you're here today. We have a very illustrious list of panelists. Um, we've been in an unprecedented time as it relates to the active versus passive um, balance in the markets, where it's been very favorable for passive strategies. The market's up 27% this year, and usually the defense of the hedge fund industry is that they have managed the volatility of the markets better. But here's something that's very difficult to, to balance, which is that the sharp ratio of the S&P is over three. So it, it's been a very difficult environment for, for active strategies to really outperform because the, the market's just been going up and, and up. Having said that, we are at a pivotal point in the industry where opportunities are looking incredible for the hedge fund industry. So I'd like to hand it over to our panelists, and maybe we could start with Hashem, to introduce their firm, but also address some of the themes that they're most excited about as they look to 2020, but also the near term. Hashem, maybe. Thank you, Deepak. So, I mean, I know that people are interested to hear what is sort of interesting in the next year or two. To us, you know, the industry hasn't changed much. In the liquid market, there is always going to be skilled managers who can eke an alpha. And uh, uh, that alpha sometimes is very attractive and sometimes it's, it's not attractive. And then the same thing when you look, when you look to the illiquid markets. So, uh, so from our point of view, I, I, I think, you know, like you said about the equity market running up, I think anybody who's managing money in a disciplined, structured way, he knows very well that, you know, the equity market, sometimes it's going to have a higher run up, a very high sharp ratio, and then it's going to come down. When you look at history, like we've been managing money f uh, for Abu Dhabi over the past 30 years, and now we do our own thing, the history of asset classes, sharp ratio is 0.3 you go have periods up and down. So if you want to play the game of trying to see what is the best uh, winner out there, I think you know, you're going to run into, uh, uh, into trouble. Uh, so, 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 so my answer, I think, you know, yes, if you want to be long equities, there's always a place for a manager who can manage the risk. And I think the, uh, at this particular point in time, I would rather be in an equity long, long short manager versus being directionally long equities. If you're building a portfolio and you want uncorrelated trades, always, you know, absolute return, uncorrelated return streams is always favorable in, 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 in different times. So again, I don't, see a, I don't see a problem in this. I know there are people who, who become sensitive about hedge fund performance. Yes, not everybody can be a star. So I think, you know, if you, uh, if you think, you know, that that fund is going to always be, 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 be the star, not all of them are going to be that. So yes, equities will have a, will be a, a beta will always be a, be a big driver. But, but but then you know how you manage that beta is the skill set which you pay money for. So I don't know if that's. Could, sort could of you spend a minute just on Liwa and your background? Mm -hmm. So basically, my partner and I uh, uh, we started our career uh, at Adia, and then uh, we were asked by the government, Khalifa specifically, to to set up Adic. So so we did that. And that was kind of version 2.0 of really sovereign wealth fund investment for us. And then we decided, you know, after nine years, why don't we offer that, that sort of know-how to friends and family? And then we decided, why don't we to run it actually as a business? So we have uh, uh, two funds, our version of how money should be allocated. And uh, that's really who, who we are. Perfect. Rick. Thank you. Rick Gerson, Falcon Edge Capital. So in most businesses or services, they have to come up with a product 
that's differentiated that people want. And they have to go about this in a competitive environment where they continually develop and adapt and, importantly, know where they want to be. But for some reason in our industry, people don't do this as much. They just sort of invest for the sake of investing without having a clear mission, a clear goal that's differentiated just as it would be for any other product or service that you encounter in your everyday life. So recognizing this, what we try to do is to think of it as coming up with something very specific that's different that we do, like any company would that makes a product. So for us, it's to create an uncorrelated return stream for our investors. Simple as that. Uncorrelated to the market and also uncorrelated to any macro factor, like interest rates or the price of oil or uh, credit spreads. But the big one is, is uncorrelated to equity markets. So if that's where we want to be, if that's the end goal, then we have to reverse engineer, just as if we had a product that we knew we wanted to make, we have to reverse engineer, how do we do that? How do we create this uncorrelated return stream? And the way that we do it is in a highly systematic and organized approach where the individual positions themselves have to be uncorrelated, either because of the nature of the security, it is physically uncorrelated, or it has to be able to be expressed in a way that makes it uncorrelated. Otherwise, it's difficult for us to do. But that's only part of the equation, and we have a system that, that helps us capture this in a factual way. The, the other half, if not two-thirds of the equation, is how it comes together. So we have a system that ensures that the portfolio of these ideas, the aggregation of these ideas, is uncorrelated. And anything that makes it through the first filter and the second filter uh, creates a portfolio that's uncorrelated. And uncorrelated means that in down markets, we should be able to do well. And it doesn't mean that, that we're short biased or that we're a put option on the market, but that it, it should be able to do well in a down market. And so just to kind of sum up, there's, and we'll probably get into this more later, there, there's a time to be aggressive and, and there's a time to be careful and to be prepared. And it seems to us that this is a time to be careful and to be prepared. And so in the end, we try to create this uncorrelated return stream that's totally disconnected from anything else our investors have or the market. Great. Mike? Hi. I'm Mike Vranos. Um, I started my career on Wall Street 36 years ago in 1983 at Kidder Peabody. For the uh, ensuing 11 years, my team and I produced over 200 billion of structured securities. So I've been in fixed income and structured credit and structured products for 36 years. After that 11 years, with uh, initial seed money from the Ziff brothers, we started our firm, Ellington Management Group. We uh, manage $8.5 billion of capital, again, mostly in structured securities, 100% fixed income. Our returns are not correlated to stocks. I would also argue that active management in fixed income is, uh, is actually preferable to passive. Um, so as we uh, grew our firm, we started a couple public companies that trade on the New York Stock Exchange. The roots of the partnership go back to 1979 with a couple of my classmates in math class at Harvard. Right now, we have over a quarter of our firm dedicated to research with a strong pipeline of researchers from math in math and physics from Harvard and Yale. Our head of research is John Genicopoulos, who's the James Tobin Professor of Economics at Yale. We've been dealing with big data for 25 years, starting with writing prepayment models in the mid-90s and early 90s that are agent-based with tens of millions of borrowers. Now we're dealing with over 100 million loans and a billion data points from which to write our models. I believe the edge going forward for hedge funds is dealing with big data intelligently, cleaning it, and writing, uh, writing very efficient and intelligent models around it. And that w I think that's the edge going forward. We've been actively involved in all, very, in all areas of research around the consumer prepayment and default question. 
And uh, I'll go talk about that more in a, in a little bit, but thank you. Okay, Jason. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Mudrick. I'm the founder and chief investment officer of Mudrick Capital Management. We're an investment firm with offices in New York City and London that specializes in distressed credit. We manage approximately $3 billion across hedge fund, private equity fund, and managed account structures, primarily for institutional clients. So as I brainstormed with my fellow panelists about the topic today, uh, opportunities in modern markets, I coalesced around two thoughts. Uh, first, what has changed in markets over the course of my career, which spans 20 years and two cycles? And where are we finding opportunities today in the short term, in spite of those changes? Uh, on the first topic, what's changed? Uh, a couple of thoughts jumped out. Uh, the first biggest change that we've seen is uh, the growth of efficiencies in the markets. I would argue markets today, particularly in liquid equity markets, have become hyper-efficient. 20 years ago, there was hundreds of funds managing hundreds of billions of dollars. Today, there's thousands of funds managing trillions and trillions of dollars. And one out of three listed equities that trades every day is traded by a computer. It's our job as managers to have an edge to deliver alpha. To do that today in liquid markets with this competitive landscape is very, very challenging. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's become much, much more difficult. So where are we finding opportunities today in spite of that? The credit markets, specifically the less liquid credit markets, have a moat around them from a number of the phenomenon that have made equity markets so hyper-efficient. First of all, computers can't trade credit, particularly less liquid credit, at least not yet. So we have a moat around our opportunity set from computer-driven trading. Two, all the newer hedge funds that have grown from those hundreds of funds to thousands of funds, it's very difficult for newer hedge funds because they usually start smaller to traffic in a distressed credit. Distressed credit by its nature is very resource intensive. Um, we sit on creditors committees, boards of directors. It's very hard to do that with a smaller pool of capital and a smaller team. And also credit has become very illiquid, particularly event-driven credit. Most newer launches are launching with monthly or quarterly liquidity, and you really need private credit or private equity vehicles to invest in distressed credit. So we've been insulated from a lot of the proliferation of hedge funds. Um, the second thing that's changed quite dramatically is obviously the interest rate environment. And while that's not um, potentially not a permanent phenomenon, and we could sit up here and debate uh, the consequences of lower interest rates all day long, one thing I can assure you is when you have good economic growth and low interest rates, which we've had in developed countries for the last 10 years, it encourages a lot of borrowing. Um, so the leveraged credit markets, which are levered loans and high-yield bonds, which are primarily corporate credit that get distressed, was $1.2 trillion in the U.S. going into the last financial crisis. It's approaching $3 trillion today. So as we think about opportunities today in modern markets, which have become hyper-efficient, the, le the uh, event-driven credit market, which is grown quite large and is continuing to grow, is very insulated and still has a lot of inefficiencies. Let's move um, a little bit to longer-term investment themes. Um, many of you will be familiar with the region, and some of the large allocators here are thinking about investments over multi-decade cycles. If you were to think, and, and hedge funds are not always thought of as the place to look at the longer term, but you are all experienced investment professionals. I'd like you to think a little bit about beyond the short term and what are the, the themes that you're excited about and specifically talk about the evolution that your, head, your businesses have gone through that will be a guide to where you're heading. Mike, I'd like to start with you because you spoke a little bit about how big data has been really um, playing a very important role in the future yeah. of your business. Can you talk about when you started embracing that and what that means for you going forward? Yeah, so we've been involved with big data for almost 30 years. Just by virtue of the amount of data you get on a consumer, you might have 100 million consumers and each consumer has 70 data fields associated with them. And you have to associate the importance of those data fields with their ultimate decision to prepay a debt or to default on a debt or something like that. We're also starting to use big data in other, other parts of the credit market. And I want to pick up on something that Jason said. He talked about the moat 
that exists for distressed credit, and it's absolutely true. But if you go one level up and you looked at stress credit, high yield, bank loans, CDS, now you're looking at a market where there are some very big players that are looking to make that market more efficient. And they're trying to turn that market into something akin to the statistical arbitrage trades that exist in equities. We've been doing that for about three years. We're seeing others try to get into the space and it's very difficult because this moat is an interesting thing. You can't approach it from the equity side. You have to approach it from the fixed income side. Picking up again on what Jason said, 99% of the trades we do are over the counter. Okay? There, it's trade by appointment over a Bloomberg. Only 20% of the high yield market is traded electronically. And a lot of that are odd lots. You can't get good data. The trace data is old. You have to create your own data sets. If you're able to do that, which is what we do from the fixed income side, creating these massive data sets of prices, contemporaneous prices of CDS, bonds, and high yield, you can effectively do cap structure ARB trades and credit basis trades on a company by company basis to make that market more efficient. It's very difficult to do it. It's a very slow process, but that's where alpha is. And so are you saying that the, the electronification of the equities business is about to hit the fixed income? I don't know that, and I, I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying that to be able to take advantage and make the market more efficient, you need to use a tremendous amount of data that's not publicly available. You have to create your own data sets. You have to create your own CDS curves and compare those curves to the high yield bond curves and decide what's a fair basis and do that over hundreds of names. We model over 800 high yield companies and trade that basis both long and short for hundreds of names a day. So it's credit stat ARB and fixed income, but it's incredibly clunky. It's not sexy like it's the way it's done in, in, in equities, but it's the only way to do it. You need to have a fixed income background. There's a lot of alpha there, yeah. and I think that's a long-term opportunity. You're going to see those markets get more efficient. Rick, um, you started your career, or the formative stages of your career, Blue Ridge, one of the most prominent equity long-short hedge funds. Equity long-short as a strategy is going through a number of structural shifts where beta is essentially replacing a large part of it. And so the business you run today is very different. You've evolved. You're doing event-driven, special situations but you specifically look at opportunities that are off the beaten path. Is that driven by this very, this historically low interest rate environment, or is there something else? And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that, that's an accurate observation, that the old way of doing things in our industry, if you go back from, let's say, 1980, through the mid-90s was there was a, a way to really make alpha by finding good companies and buying them and shorting bad companies and letting time sift between the two of them. This has become not only difficult, but in some cases counterintuitively wrong. And recognizing this, we've evolved, as, as you accurately said, to an uncorrelated model which requires us to be in these special situations that by themselves remove beta Beta is great when the market goes up at, with no volatility. But the, the key to be able to take advantage of dislocation is to not be dislocated. And it's not hard to predict the, the, uh, the short-term market movements or the economy. It's impossible. Yeah. And that being said, there are signs that you can look at that can inform you if you're uh, in a period of time that is fairly late. And so just a couple of, of highlights that suggest that. One is, at some point, we're going to run out in the US of people who are unemployed, yet not have any wage growth in order for the expansion to continue. Second thing is, as Jason was alluding to, corporate debt issuance and, and leverage ratios are approaching not cycle highs, but all-time highs. And this is in a backdrop of something absolutely staggering that we're used to because it's been here for a little while, which is a third of all government debt actually has negative interest rates. And if you account for inflation and look at real rates, it's like two-thirds of government debt 
you're going to lose relative to even inflation. And so to have corporate debt, let's say if you compare debt to GDP at all time highs, uh, what is a particularly interesting warning sign is that there's two things that, that tend to lead equity markets in the debt markets. One is cash flow coverage, so leverage ratios, about 12 months or so uh, ahead historically has been a, a pretty good predictor. Uh, and the second thing is M&A activity. Both are at all-time highs with another weird thing where the leveraged loan market is now bigger than the high-yield market. Uh, and so you put all these things together and it makes sense if you have a long-term perspective to say, okay, I, want, I don't know when the cycle is going to end, but when it ends, it's not going to be pretty and I want to be in a position to take advantage. I don't want to be dislocated. I want to be the one who sits there like uh, in 2009 when Berkshire Hathaway was liquid as could be and, and issuing converts uh, to companies all day long. And so I think this is the opportunity. The opportunity is to be in position to take advantage of the coming dislocation. Jason, you focus on distressed investing and obviously that is a very interesting purview to where we are in the cycle. As you look at the opportunities that you're seeing, what does that tell you about how late we are in the cycle? Can, is, there, is there a lens that you can say, we see something bad about to ha hit the markets in the next six months? Is it, is it, can, you, can you address that point? Sure. <clears throat> um, so, you know, this, this cycle is very different than the last uh, two cycles. The last two cycles were much more business cycle driven. Uh, we had um, asset bubbles grow very large and then burst, um, you know, in the late 90s with the dot-com bubble which burst in the summer of 2000, throwing us into a mild recession in the US. And then obviously the real estate bubble uh, in the last decade, um, which is a very leverageable asset class. So it sort of had a double whammy as it, as it flew the, uh, uh, drew the financial sector to a, to a st standstill. Um, today, we don't have any obvious asset bubble except for debt. Uh, this is much more of an interest rate driven cycle. Um, unfortunately, for guys like us that, that make much more money when the cycle turns, uh, rate cycles are longer cycles and they're a little bit more difficult uh, to predict the timing of. Um, so as Rick mentioned, I mean, what we have seen uh, is um, huge growth in leverage. Um, the levered credit market has gotten very, very large. Um, LBO multiples are at record, back to record highs. Debt to EBITDA multiples are at record highs. And growth is just starting to slow. When you borrow a lot at all, all facets of the economy, whether it's the consumer or corporations or governments, you're effectively borrowing forward growth. And over time, growth has to be slower because more and more interest will go to service that debt rather than other avenues. So we're starting to see growth slow as we think about investment opportunities more long term. I think this is somewhat of a super debt cycle and opportunities in credit, whether it's distressed credit or other forms of dislocated credit will be where most of the alpha will be generated going forward. Hashem, one of the things that we spoke about earlier was just how thinking about winning themes in the short term is the wrong way to think about investing. You've been um, in privileged positions in large institutions in Abu Dhabi and elsewhere since 1989. One of the things you told me earlier was interesting. You said, picking a manager is not just about their performance or their, the robustness of their operational platform, it's very often other things. And, and I think that if you're, if you're new to the business, these are things that you don't know automatically and they come with experience. How important is the culture and philosophy of the hedge fund business when you think about investing? If you wouldn't mind, just one or two minutes on that and then we'll wrap yeah. up. No, I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's just like any successful business. So when people study Apple or they're studying Google, they look at the culture and they praise that culture. So hedge funds or asset managers in general, because, you know, I think these terms, we, we make them up. At the end of the day, we're all managing money in one shape or another. The culture of a firm is very important. And that's why people who spend time on building a culture and compounding are the ones that really stay in this business. And naturally, they care about the investor capital. Uh, so I can tell you, you know, st we love investors who really manage the downside very well. Because we, you know, I, I think you know, we don't have an interest in a star investor. That part is, we, we've seen how it plays. So, and when you dig down then into the culture of that firm and how they manage their affairs and how they're building up, you see how everything kind of uh, uh, fits out. So I can tell you, you know, I think people, 
mistaken, we can do this, let's do co-investments, let's do our things alone because we can sh share on fees. I think they underappreciate how difficult it is to start with your competing with thousands of people. Like as someone said, this is harder than Olympics. So you're competing with so many people and then you think you're going to create that culture to recruit the right staff to compensate them and to have people, you know, be driven, it's very tough. So, so I would really say, you know, people should really spend a lot of time, be honest with themselves, what they can do and what they can't do. So it sounds like we're, in, we're entering, a, we're, we've been in a great period. There's always been opportunities for Alpha. The key is identifying the right manager that's also driven to continuously evolve, because that's key in our business. But we might be entering into one of the most opportune t um, times for the hedge fund industries. It's, I think it's very exciting times. I think with that, we'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating, and thank you all.